around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. David Langford here today, and we'd like to welcome each of you to The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Tuesday, early in the week, and I pray that your consecration, your dedication is growing and increasing in our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you're hungry for God. You are thirsty for God. I pray that you want to be in his presence. You want to grow in his grace and in his knowledge. You want to know what it means to have a true, genuine, bona fide relationship in Christ. As my grandpa said, if you serve God long enough, Faithful enough, he said it will be as natural as a duck going barefooted. Comical, yet truthful. When you live for God a certain period of time, that's the only way that you know how to live. Now, people do backslide. I backslid as a teenager. I didn't have my roots grounded. And I suppose one of the things that my grandparents did not teach me was if I do fail, if I do sin, don't quit. Get on your knees and pray and ask God for forgiveness. Ask God for forgiveness. See, God doesn't want to lose anybody. Did you know that? Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want to lose anyone, no one. Men are lost because they fail to repent. Our Lord is a gracious God. He loves us more than we'll ever know. No mortal man understands the agape love of God. It is impossible. But we had not known love, John said, except he first loved us. That's why that love is so powerful. I said to you some months ago now, our love is not perfect toward our spouse, toward our children, our grandchildren, to our aunts, our uncles, our grandparents. Our love is not perfect. You and I do not love perfectly, but Jesus does. Jesus loves us absolutely perfectly. That's why we can Know his love and love him in return. Amen. We're looking at Psalms 37, verse 26. Redemption, retribution, and reward. Psalms 37, verse 26. He is ever merciful and lendeth and his seed is blessed. I came back to the Lord June the 6th, 1978. 
almost 46 years ago. I can honestly say I've never been forsaken. I've never begged for bread, nor has any of my children. How is that possible? Because he is ever merciful. God is always merciful. Now, we may not think that. Our human reasoning, our human understanding many times negates our ability to understand God. Our, our humanity is flawed. But see, he is ever merciful. One Hebrew translation, he is all the day long merciful. I, I never fail to be amazed at Jeremiah after the Babylonian chaos, after Jerusalem was burned and ruined and raised and literally destroyed, and there was absolutely nothing left of that city. That happened because of sin. And when I read the book of Lamentations, and you remember, what was it, a year and a half, two years ago, I read the whole book of Lamentation. I never fail to be amazed at Jeremiah as he observes everything around him is ruined. Everything is smoldering, smoking, burning, ash. Utter, 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 absolute destruction. And he says in Lamentations 3 and 21, this I recall to my mind. He's thinking, he's rehearsing, he's ruminating, he's meditating. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Think of that. This prophet of God looking at the utter destruction, and he prophesied this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to take place. It will be utterly devastating. And yet when it's all said and done, Jeremiah is freed to do as he wills. Nebuchadnezzar, one of Nebuchadnezzar's Military officers gave him food, gave him money, said, you're free, do what you want to do. See, that was the mercy God showed Jeremiah. And yet Jeremiah, as he witnesses this utter destruction throughout the land, he said, I, I recall, I, I remember in my mind Therefore have I hope. What's he remembering? He's remembering the good days, the grace, the mercy of God, yet Israel forfeited it. And I believe America is doing the same identical things today. And then when God meets out retribution and punishment, how many will be like Jeremiah and say, I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Will you have sowed enough righteous seed in the past, the previous days, weeks, months, and years? Will you have sown enough that you'll have good memories of God and say it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because 
His compassions fail not. I can hear the voices of multitudes saying now, Why, God? Why, God? Why have you allowed this to happen? And I hear the voice of the Lord because of your sins. Somehow we think we're not sinful. I read the other day where this is the one of the worst congresses that's ever convened. The 118th Congress has done less legislation in, in modern history. They blame it on the gridlock. I blame it on sin. I blame it on sin. You have people like AOC, who's always running down capitalism, advocating communism and socialism, yet her and her little boyfriend are not married, but she lies and pretends on her paperwork that he is so he can travel with her wherever she goes free of charge on the taxpayer's dime. I'm telling you, that place is rotten as hell itself. Gold bars, cash money sewn into the jacket of Menendez from New Jersey, the senator. He said, well, this is, we had to do this in Cuba. Sir, you was not born in Cuba. You were already in America. Bribery, venal, venal, the embodiment of being venal, subject, tendency, prone to be bought off. You and I, my friend, we have very little understanding or knowledge. We don't know how corrupt the system really is. Where does all this money come from? They just print it, and they burden you and I with gross, over-encumbering taxes. And little by little, but slowly but slowly, we become a tyrannical nation. It's only because of the civility of many people, that and Christians, that have kept this nation from becoming a powder keg. But I'm telling you, in the Holy Ghost, that's going to change very soon. You know, it, 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 if you turn west and you stay that way, you're going to end up in California. If you're in California and you turn east and you stay that way, you're coming to the east coast, you're coming to New York. It is inevitable. It must happen. So it is in this nation. We've sown to the wind. We're going to reap the whirlwind. Even Chucky Schumer said to Gorsuch and one of the other Supreme Court justices, you've sown to the wind. You're going to reap the whirlwind threatening, trying to intimidate. Let me see them try to intimidate God in the day of judgment. It will be absolutely off the charts. I want to go back and look at verse 26 here in Psalms 37. He, the redeemed, the blood bought, he is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. The righteous, the redeemed, the blood-bought. They're generous people. They're willing to lend to others when called upon. David said even their children or their seed are also blessed because the believer has chosen to live in covenant with God Almighty. You read your Bible, there were some very, very wealthy men in the Bible, Job, Abraham, 
even Nicodemus. And there were there were women throughout the book of Acts that were rich, affluent. But their heart, their affection was not set on money. Their heart, their affection was set on God. See, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. God knows where our treasure, he knows where our hearts are. I ask today, where is your treasure? Where is your heart? What is your heart set upon? Is it set upon serving the Lord? Is it set upon being faithful? Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. I heard one of the prosperity preachers preach, Jesus wants everybody to be rich. Jesus never said that. What he did say is, the poor you have with you always. There's always going to be poor people, less fortunate people. Poor people are held in contempt and disdain. But friend, you could be poor too. I could be extremely poor. But you see, serving the Lord brings blessings. When I was backslidden away from God, I wasn't doing well financially. God doesn't bless sin. And I know people think, well, look at the sinners out there, how much money they've got. Yes, they have a lot of money, but if they don't repent, they're going to hell in the end. Thus Jesus in Mark 8, 36, 37, what should it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Many today desire to climb the ladder of success. I look at a poor, pathetic, fallen creature like Hunter Biden. Look at the shackles, the weights, the savagery of sin as it's taken a toll on that man's life. Oh, he thinks he's been living it up. He says the Republicans are trying to kill him. See, that's deception. It is the enemy, Satan, who wants to kill him, not, not a Republican party, though they may want to mete out some measure of just, just judgment or justice. But it is the enemy, Satan, that, that takes such a toil on people's lives. He wrecks, he ruins people's lives. And he will not stop until he sees their life on the heap pile of ruination, over, destroyed, and done with. But to the redeemed, David said in verse 26, he is ever merciful, lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Some of you listening today, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God has been extremely, extremely merciful to you while you were in sin. God should have cut you off, done away with you, but he was merciful. And you've been blessed. You know you've been blessed. You've been supernaturally blessed. Because you have been faithful to the Lord. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. David is assuring the believer 
that if you will depart from evil, when evil seeks to be your companion, when evil seeks to set up shop in your life, if you will depart from it, if you will do good, you will dwell forevermore. David is assuring the believer, if we turn from evil when evil is presented to us and we seek to do well, we will live forever in the land because the land or the earth is our eternal inheritance. Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You're not going to inherit heaven. When you die, you may go there. But that is a temporary place of residence. You're, you're coming back to the earth. I, I, I am amazed at how people dwell about heaven, heaven, going to heaven, etc., and you will go there if you die in the Lord but you're not going to stay there. He's bringing you back to the earth. By the way, he only brings back to the earth those which have died in him. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. It's only those who have died in Christ is Christ bringing back with him to the earth. And then, if we are alive and remain, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds. They're coming down. We're going up. Why are we going up? We're going to meet the Lord in the air. Why are we going to meet the Lord in the air? He's going to vent his wrath on this earth. And we're not appointed unto God's wrath, are we? No. The blood of the Lamb has assured every one of us that the wrath of God will not fall on us because we are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Romans 5 and verse 9, being much more than than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What am I justified by? Justified by his blood. Remember I taught you two, three years ago, Justification, it is though you have never sinned. You are holy, you are just, you are pure, you are undefiled. What makes you like that is the blood of the Lamb, hallelujah. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ. My, my, my. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood, the precious blood of the Lamb, the spotless Lamb, the sinless Lamb the eternal Lamb of God, who was Jesus Christ. His blood was shed. It was not spilled. When I hear singers, gospel singers, talk about his blood being spilled, I laugh. That is so theologically erroneous and full of error. His blood was shed, not spilled. When you spill something, that is an accident. I spilled my milk. I spilled my coffee. Kids knock over a glass at the dinner table. They spilled it. They didn't mean to do that. That's an accident. Christ's death was not an accident. His blood was not spilled. His blood was shed. Romans, excuse me, Hebrews 9, 22. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It was shed purposefully, with intent, on purpose. Not an accident. It wasn't spilled. Shed. There's a difference when something is shed. So the blood of the Lamb is shed that you and I might be redeemed and inherit eternal life. David said, depart from evil. Oh, if men, if men would just depart from evil, Evil is lurking. Evil is at every side. Evil is at every turn. And if men would just turn away from evil, there it is. You see it. You see the evil. When you see the evil, walk away from it. You'll save yourself a lot of heartache, a lot of hardship. How many of us in our lives have done something 
And we said, as soon as we did it, I wish I had not done that. That's the Holy Spirit dealing with your conscience and telling you, you have erred. You have messed up. But see, God is so gracious. He will help us, though we have messed up. And every one of us listening, at one time or another, we've messed up. We've done something. We regret having done it. But it's done. Our objective is to stay dedicated, separated, consecrated to Christ, and sow good seed so that we never have to reap a bad harvest, an evil harvest. Depart from evil and do good. Depart from evil. Do good. They are exact opposites, evil and good, the tree of good and of evil. They are exact opposites. Depart from the evil, embrace the good, and dwell forevermore. That is an assurance of eternal life in Christ. That Just that one phrase, evermore, and dwell forevermore. For all eternity, if you are in Jesus Christ, if you're not in Jesus Christ, you will not have that. You will not have that when you embrace evil. When you embrace evil, you cannot do that which is good. You cannot do that which is right because you're being controlled by that which is evil. Again, as I said yesterday, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot have it both ways, though there are those who seek to have it both ways in the end. You cannot have it both ways. You can't say I'm a servant of the Lord and live a life of sin. You can't do that. You're either serving God or you're serving the devil. It's just that simple. It's just that easy. I know that sometimes sounds too easy, too simplistic, but it is. You see, when we come to the place and state in our lives where we say that is right, that is wrong. No ifs, ands, and buts. No conjunctions whatsoever. It's just wrong or it's just right. Which one will it be in your life? Which one will it be in your life? Just like Joshua 24, 15 Choose you this day whom you shall serve, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua made a decision and lived with it. Will you make the right decision and live with it? Or will you make a decision and then sit there and say, well, you know, I don't know if I need to be that committed. Friend, if you're not committed we're living in an hour when you need to get committed to Christ. With what's coming, you don't want to be uncommitted. Get committed to Jesus. Getting committed will change your life. The renowned phrase regarding the Marines, be all that you can be. You can be more than what you are right now if you so choose. I don't have anything that you cannot have. I'm nobody special. I put my pants on every day just like any other man. I have difficulties and problems. You have no idea the many problems I face. But I just... Try to go on and keep my hand on the plow and don't look back, just keep on plowing. Luke 9, 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. 
Some people, sadly, are not fit for the kingdom of God. Why are they not fit? Because they keep looking back. Let me tell you something about farming. You cannot look back and plow your rows straight. It is impossible to look back and plow your rows straight. They will become crooked. If you keep looking back, they're going to veer to the left. They're going to veer to the right. you got to keep looking straight. and Therefore, you can keep your rows straight in the garden, in the field, wherever you're plowing, planting, etc. Jesus said there in Luke 9, 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit or worthy of the kingdom of God. You must be found worthy. Luke 21, 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Will you be found worthy to stand before God? And Jesus Christ says to you in that day, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Every Christian wants to hear that phrase. And every Christian will hear that phrase if they press onward, if they remain in Christ, if they put their hand to the plow and not look back like Lot's wife. Genesis 19, 26, and she looked back from behind him, him, Lot, and she became a pillar of salt. Why was she turned into a pillar of salt? She looked back. She looked back. What was the one commandment the angels gave Lot and his family? Don't look back. Only one commandment, only one condition, one. But she couldn't resist the temptation. Satan knew her weakness. What was her weakness? Her weakness was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Her heart was in Sodom. Her heart was not with God. I wish I could tell you the truth. Luke 17, verse 32. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. I don't even know her name. Nobody knows her name. There may be some through Archaeology have tempted to identify her, her name through history, etc., etc., through genealogy. But Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, but he never names her. Did Jesus say, remember Mary, the mother of Jesus? Mother of God? Did he say, remember Hannah, who was barren and Sought the face of God till God touched her womb. She became fruitful. Elkanah, her husband, knew her, and she brought forth a man child, and his name was Samuel. Did God say, Remember Hannah? Did God say, Remember Samson? Did God say, Remember Eve? Did God say, Remember the psalmist David, the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Ezekiel? No. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Why? Because she lost out with God because she was disobedient. You see, there was something in her that Satan could appeal to. Years ago, I was just a a young boy. I say young, I don't know, 12, 13, 14. And, And I saw a movie on television, and it was about Sodom and Gomorrah. And when the women would close their eyelids, they had painted another eye on the outside of the eyelid. 
And it was the most bizarre-looking thing because when their eyes would wink, close, there was not a solid flesh tone. It was another eye. And it, it was heinous. It was hideous-looking, like some kind of a creature. Well, what it was was a demonic sense, a demonic spirit, a demonic entity, demonic influence. There's so much demonic influence in the earth right now, it is immeasurable. There is so much demonic influence in the earth right now, it is immeasurable. It is terrible. The craziness. I read the other day where a young man, 22, 23 years of age, he hit someone on the interstate, killed them, the body came up, went through the windshield. The kid was high. He drove 40 miles, pulled into a restaurant, parking lot, passed out. When he came to, the police were already there. He didn't even know he had a dead corpse in his front seat that he had hit on the highway, and it came up and went through the windshield and landed in his front seat. You're going to see men lose their sensitivity to God. They're going to become more bizarre, more weird. I read the other day of a road rage incident. I think it was in California. The person uh, who supposedly got cut off by the couple the other individuals shot eight times into the couple's car and killed the four-year-old child in the back seat, shot the child three times out of eight shots. Road rage. Our world is becoming chaotic. Our world is becoming unglued. Jesus said, as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the coming of the Son of Man. What was so unique about Noah's day? Man's heart was on evil continually, meaning he dwelt on nothing but evil. All day long, all night, their minds, their thoughts were on one thing. Their imagination was on evil continually, continually. Genesis 6 and 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. The wickedness of man, the wickedness of men was great in the earth. I'm telling you, we are a wicked people, folks. You say, well, I, I don't appreciate you being that candid. I don't appreciate you being that frank. I don't appreciate you being that forward. You don't like the word of God? I'm telling you what the Bible says. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination, in other words, the word every there in the Hebrew means his whole thoughts, everything in his mind in perpetuity was evil, evil. The every thought of his mind and of his heart was only evil continually, continually, every day, every day, evil, 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 evil. Through the prophet Jeremiah, talking about Israel, he said, oh, my people, they know how to do evil, but to do right, they don't have the slightest clue in the world how to do that which is right. They don't know. They don't know. But when it comes to evil, he said, oh, they know how to do it. Jeremiah 4 and 22. For my people, notice God's talking to his elect. 
the ecclesia, the called out ones, the chosen ones. For my people is foolish. We're not talking about the world. He's talking about Christians, professing believers and Jehovah. My people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish, S-O-T-T-I-S-H. What does that word mean? That means nothing but foolishness. My people, they are foolish children. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. What a tragic, sad, heartbreaking statement for God to say about his people. To do good, they have no knowledge. To do evil, they know all about it. They are wise. Wise. Paul in Romans 1 talks about inventors of evil things. Think of that. Men sit around, meditate, ruminate to devise evil devices, evil things. Romans 1.30 backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Think about that. Haters of God. They hate God. They hate God with a passion. They hate him. I know what some are thinking. Well, I know I'm not living right, but I don't really hate God. Yes, you do. If you love God, you'd serve him. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Do you love the Lord? Yes, pastor, I love the Lord. Then serve him and keep his commandments. Well, I don't want to be committed. <laughs> don't want to be committed. Many are committed to their sin. They're committed to their adultery. They are committed to their fornication. They are committed to their sodomy. They're committed to their dope, their liquor. They're committed to their pornography. They're committed. They do it all the time. Inventors of evil things. You know, the more and the longer you serve the Lord, the more you come out of the world the more ignorant you become to the world and its inventions and its ways, its system. Why? Because you're not a part of it. It's foreign to you. Why? Because you are a dedicated child of God and everything around you is foreign. Oh, I'm not going there. Like all of you, I've seen things on television. I thought I wanted to watch it, but all of a sudden here came out a curse word. Turn a channel. I'm not going to entertain that. I don't want that in my spirit. I don't want that in my heart. I don't want that in my mind. I don't want that. The barbarity of Hamas, and I, I, I get all the emails and read this, read that, and all this stuff. What they did to those people, one lady was shot 40 to 50 times in the face. The two Israeli soldiers didn't know what it was. They thought it was a body part, but it was a woman's face. It was her head. She had been shot 40 to 50 times with a high-powered rifle. That is savagery. That is barbarity. That is heinous and cruel. It is immeasurable. Putting babies in ovens. Raping women to the extent their pelvic bones were crushed. Crushed. The barbarity. The brutality. And you know, I, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to upset some people, but that's all right. I get hear, tired of hearing people talk about the Palestinians, the Palestinians. They are complicit. Why don't they rise up and quit voting in Hamas as their government. This new book that I'm writing, Zechariah chapter 14, gives a lot of revelation 
how things will transpire during the millennial. If you don't go to the Feast of Tabernacles, God says, I'll send famine, drought, and plague. If people don't come up to the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles to worship me. Now, I believe the possibility exists. You may not be able to go. But say a city, a country, a nation would send representatives to Jerusalem to worship Jehovah. And God said, because you took the time to send a representative to honor me, I will not allow you to be cursed, have famine, drought, and plague, et cetera, et cetera. Because you sent goodly, godly leadership to worship me. I don't know. Maybe they can't get there. Maybe they don't have the money to get to Jerusalem. I don't know. But if they sent a, 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 like, like a congressman from a district to represent the people, I believe in the millennial, you'll see people who'll say, we're tired of the famine. We're tired of the drought. We, we are tired of the plague. If we can't go, let's send somebody to represent us, and God will honor that. Why? Because they're desirous to do that which is right. You see, we think in general that when we vote, we're sending somebody up there that's going to represent us. That day has come and gone. That boat has sailed. They do not represent us. They represent themselves. When they leave, they make all of this money because of the backdoor deals they cut while they were in office in legislation. Payback time, honey. I got you this contract. I got you Solyndra. Now Biden's trying to push some kind of greenhouse solar garbage like Obama did. And Obama's company, Solyndra, Surrender, it went bankrupt too. How, the, how do these people become multimillionaires? It's corrupt. It's corrupt. See, we, we, we are in a state and a place. We, 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 we can't trust anybody hardly anymore, especially when it comes to our national government. But no matter what, in closing today, let me, let me admonish you in this way. No matter what comes, no matter what goes, you must depart from evil. I've had people to try to coerce me to do things that I knew in my spirit was wrong, and I said, I am not going to do that. I won't do that. I want to be like Naboth. I am not for sale. I'm not selling out. I'm, I'm too late in the journey. I'll be 69 years old next month. 69 years old. 11 years from now, I'll be 80 years old. My life will have been well spent. There's never a good time to compromise. Oh, I, I get so tired of that rhetoric in Washington. Compromise is a good word. We don't always get what we want. We don't get what we want because we get sold out. Who in America in their right mind wants the open borders? Who in their right mind wants that? The people don't want it. We have 50 million refugees that are born or were not born here, 50 million. This nation is being overrun by refugees and illegal immigrants. They're trying to change the demographics of our nation. This is why it's tyranny. It's absolute unmitigated tyranny. And I've said it and I'll say it again. If there is a terrorist attack in America, Every director of every alphabet agency and this administration should be tried for treason. Don't give some excuse. Well, we don't know how they got in here. Chris Ray says, all I see is blinking, flashing lights, flashing, blinking lights. That's all I see. Warning, warning, warning. 
You're part of the problem. But see, corruptness says we'll create the problem and we'll have the solution and the answer and the people will fall for it. Why? Because the people are evil. The people are evil. They're blind to truth because they live and they serve the devil. So they're already blind and they become more blind to the truth when the truth is presented to them. As Jeremiah said, to do evil, oh, they are so wise. To do good, they have no understanding. They just, they just don't understand how to do what's right. See, this is where godliness, godly, righteous living comes into our lives. Listen, my time is but gone. You must depart from evil. You must seek to do good, and God will take care of you. I said, God will take care of you if you will seek to do that which is right. If you don't, he's not going to take care of you. You're going to suffer from your own ill will. Your will must not be ill. It must not be diseased. It, not, it must not be contaminated. Your will must be pure, and your heart must be to serve God. Depart from evil and do good. Tomorrow or Thursday, there will be an opportunity to come into your life to have an opportunity, a chance to depart from evil and do good or to capitulate, to surrender and do evil and fail to do good. You, that, that, that situation, that circumstance, that proposition is going to approach you in the coming days. What will it be? Will you do the right thing? Will you depart from evil? Will you do good? Or will you embrace it? Will you embrace the evil when it is presented to you? It'll be your choice. What will be the choice? Do good or do evil? I pray when you are presented with that in the coming days, and I'm telling you, there's going to be something that's going to come to you, and you're going to have to make a decision. Will I do that which is right? Depart, abstain from evil, and do that which is good? Or will I compromise and not do the right thing? It will be a choice. Your conscience will say, you cannot do that. You cannot go there. You cannot say that. You, you cannot embrace that. You cannot be a part of that. But if you dwell too long on evil, evil will seize you. Evil will seize you and bring you into its clutches and you will be subjected to it and you will do what it commands of you to do. If it's to tell a lie, if it's to cheat, to steal, to embezzle. You see, Satan presents us with evil opportunities every day. And God the Holy Ghost presents to us opportunities to do good and righteous. And as a human being, as a person, man or woman, which will you do? What will you do in that scenario? Which way will you go? As the old song says, I'd rather have Jesus than all the wealth of this world and its fame. I'd rather have Jesus more than anything 
You see, when you fall in love like that, it's not easy to say, uh, it's, it's not hard to say no to the devil. You'll just say, nope, and you move on. You don't even dwell on it. You don't even labor on it or in it. You just, no, I'm going this way. But if you're weak, you're anemic spiritually, and that opportunity is presented to you, if you're not where you need to be with God, you will capitulate, you will surrender, and you will do that which is evil. When we are told, depart from evil and do good. Sow good seeds, people. Sow good seeds of righteousness. Sow the goodness of God. Sow the mercy of God. David said, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But even Satan presented an evil situation to the psalmist. He was weak. I'm telling you, the devil knows how to appeal to everyone and their hearts and their lives where they are. He knows what to do to pull you down. Don't let him. Oh, don't let the devil pull you down. Be like Paul said there in Ephesians 4, neither give place to the devil. Don't give him any opportunity. Don't give the devil any room whatsoever in your life. Don't let it happen. It's a choice. Sometimes it's a hard choice. But don't give any place to Satan. Ephesians 4, 27, neither give place to the devil. Don't give him that opportunity. Say, no, I'm not going there. I'm going the way of the Lord. I'm going the way of righteousness. I'm going to do that which is right in the sight of God. Let me invite you to be with us this coming September the 20th, 21st, and 22nd, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Please let us know how many is coming in your party. This may be the last opportunity. We have a chance to have a revival meeting. You need the fellowship, you need the Holy Ghost, and you need the Word of God. And by His grace, He'll help us provide that when you come and you attend. God bless you. Have a great week. I'll see you next week in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.